afternoon. The Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee will come to order. Today is February 8th, 2023. Uh, we have a long agenda today, so we're just going to ask people to pay attention to that uh, as we're working our way through. Um, an update on that agenda. Um, the uh, last item, uh, Senate File 893, uh, is not going to be heard today. Um, the, uh, the stakeholders that I've talked with are already aware of that. Um, but if there's anyone else who came just for that bill, there's no reason to stick around for it. That's on the end of the uh, published agenda. Our first item, Senate File 1138, Senator Klein, genetic testing. Go ahead and make your presentation, Senator. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Latson. Members of the committee, I'm very grateful that you are hearing Senate File uh, 1138 today. This is a consumer protection bill and is a Minnesotan's data privacy bill. Uh, Minnesotans who uh, submit to home genetic testing have the right to know that they have control over that data, that it will be not, not be sold to merchants or uh, investigators against their knowledge or against their will. Uh, and that's what Senate File 1138 attempts to do, is give them control over that data. It establishes various protections for consumers who submit biological samples to direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. It requires testing companies to obtain the consumer's express consent, provide privacy notices to the consumer, and protect the security of the consumer's genetic data from unauthorized disclosures. Mr. Chair, at your discretion, I can go through the subdivisions of the bill, or we can go to my testifiers. I know you have a time constraint. Thank you, Senator Klein. Does your testifier wish to make some remarks at this time? Good afternoon, Chairman Lutz, uh, Ranking Member Limmer, and members of the committee. My name is Richie Englehart, and I'm the head of government affairs at Ancestry. I'm here today on behalf of the Coalition for Genetic Data Protection in strong support of this bill. Ancestry is proud of the work that we've done with our coalition partners, including 23andMe, to implement common sense privacy protections that ensure consumers are in control of their genetic data at all times. Together with Privacy Advocates and the Future of Privacy Forum, a leading nonprofit that focuses on privacy thought leadership, we develop what we believe are the appropriate guidelines for direct-to-consumer genetic testing services. This includes ensuring consumers provide separate express consents, meaning we cannot bury those consents in our terms of service or our privacy policies and just hope that they see it, for any collection, processing, or sharing of their genetic data. The separate express consents would be required for analyzing a consumer's biological sample, storing that sample after it's been analyzed for future testing opportunities. And I'll note that's completely optional. If they don't want to bank the sample, they can still use the service. Viewing genetic relatives on the website, and both parties have to provide a separate consent before that match would be revealed to either of them. Using a consumer's genetic data for marketing for any purpose. Uh, neither Ancestry nor 23andMe use uh, genetic data for marketing. It doesn't pass the creepiness test for us. But if anybody did want to use that kind of data for targeted advertising, we believe a separate express consent should be required. Um, research, so if a consumer opts in to participate in research programs, that would kick them into an informed consent process. The same rules that govern any clinical trial research in the US or any other human subject research would apply, all falling under the common rule. And then lastly, sharing their data with any third party for any reason. We would have to get a separate express consent to share genetic data. Aside from the consents that we must collect from consumers, they're empowered to delete their data at any time and have a biological sample they pre previously stored destroyed within 30 days under this bill. SF 1138 puts these protections into law, outlining our responsibility to Minnesotans and clearly explaining their rights when they engage with direct consumer genetic testing services to learn more about their genealogy or health. This approach has broad bipartisan support and stakeholder support. Since 2021, six states have enacted similar laws, including Arizona, California, Kentucky, Maryland, Utah, and Wyoming. So some very progressive and very conservative states on that list. Aside from Minnesota, 10 other states have similar measures in progress this year. And while Ancestry and 23andMe have adhered to these practices the entire time we have offered DTC genetic testing products, this bill will ensure that every direct-to-consumer testing service is held to the same standards for privacy and data protections. Our consumers' trust is our top priority. Bottom line, if they don't trust us, they just won't use us. We're an optional service, and we urge a favorable report on SF-1138. I can answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Englehart. You'll be around for the duration of the bill. If the committee has questions, we'll go on with the rest of our testifiers now. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Uh, we have Rich Newmeister signed up. Uh, while Mr. Newmeister is coming forward to testify, I will note that we have a quorum present for the committee. Mr. Newmeister, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Rich, uh, Rich Neumeister. I'm putting on my privacy advocate hat on today with this bill. What's very important to realize is that there are two thoughts that I have when I view this bill and which will relate into my testimony. First of all, I suspect this legislation. I question it because it is written by the industry to regulate itself and then seeks the blessing of the Minnesota legislature. That's one thought. Number two, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee know I have a long, long history working in this room with your predecessors and many current members that Minnesota has high standards for privacy protections and rights. And that is continuously. And many times we get compared with California. California and Minnesota always rank high for privacy protections and rights. We're different than other states. Now this then comes to the point here as to what are some of the significant things that are not in this bill that I think that has to meet the high standards of Minnesotans. Let's get to the chase. A major thing is how do you incentivize these companies to comply with the law that they are suggesting that you adopt. If you look at the enforcement mechanism, it's done through the Department of Commerce with an anemic 45.072 or 027, I believe. Mr. Chairman and many and members of the committee, because of our high standards, we believe that it's important for a right of private action. And now I'm going to demonstrate to you where this has happened in the Minnesota calligraphy of privacy protections and rights. 13.386, when government has genetic data on you, disseminated, shared, whatever it might be, you have a right remedies under chapter 13, which you are familiar with. The Minnesota Health Records Act, 144.298, when in the context of a health provider, license and go on and on, they do genetic testing, they do disclosure, with, and in all the protocols, you have a right to action in that similar thing. And another one that I worked on with former Senator Tennyson, Mr. Chairman, back in 1988 and 89, the Fair Information Insurance. It's ironic that he's here, and now I'm talking about that law, because one of the things that we fought over was about the right for individual right to private action, when insurance companies have this kind of information. And that's in 72A.503. And you'll see where there's that right to private action. So Mr. Chairman, I think that's one of the important things that this committee has to discuss and debate. Now, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the previous testifier talked about the six states where this model language is going through. But there are a number of states that have some real unique nuances. And again, one of those state, great states where we're on par with is California. So one of the things that, like in California, and this is where we start getting into the definitions. If you look at lines two on 2.1 of the bill, they talk about genetic test com company. Well, I look at our bill, and then I look at California's language, which defines it in three distinct ways, where they use action words like sell, markets, interprets, discloses, collects. It's very clear it's expansive in the literature that I've seen. So granted, remember, what, who is pushing this bill is the Coalition for Genetic Data Protection. And you go to their website, and who are the two big groups of it, and the only two? 23andMe and Ancestry. Now, at late yesterday afternoon, I called the Washington number, their office out there. So I spoke with, with a, <coughs> person out there, 
He's telling them, I'm trying to get a hold of John Reich, their lobbyist, to discuss the bill. And I went over the points, and one of the points that she shared they had concerns about was the right of action, or private action. So I know that's a big issue with them, because they don't like. But in some, like in Wyoming, they have a right to private action, but uh, it's somewhat nuanced that you can't incentivize to use that right until you talk to the company first, which I oppose. I went on the tangent here, but let me just get to the definitions. So the definitions, for example, would I believe would not apply to the following. It would apply to Ancestry and, and 23andMe, but Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, what there is now, there's a new business that says, okay, you come to our laboratory, we'll do the testing at our laboratory, and we'll tell you the results or whatever. I don't know if this covers that area or not. In California, it's expansive enough, it does. When we're doing a bill like this, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, once it's on the books, as all of us know, particularly long timers, it's hard to change. I think it's important to get this right. One of the other things that the California language has, because these kinds of companies hire contractors out, there's a specific provision talking what a service provider is. That's that third party that handles genetic information or whatever it may be. I don't know if it's covered in here. It doesn't say that, but in the California law, it defines what a service provider is. Another item is then Mr. Chairman, some other areas is the area of consent, which we here in Minnesota has always made sure it's very clear, it's very concise and direct that you, a Minnesotan, has a clear understanding of what the law means. So one of the things that I want to make some standards of is something like language that says that, a, that any kind of notice or consent is that an ordinary person can understand. That's a standard. One of the things that I've seen in other states, but we don't have here, a very concise and direct point in law that you can revocate your consent. I don't see that in this bill. It's a strong part of the California bill. When they talk about 30 days, that may be a policy, but it's not in law like it is in California in regards to the destruction of the sample, or even reacting to the consent. Mr. Chairman, there are many items about this bill that deals with the most sensitive information about ourselves. It is a burgeoning industry. It's going to expand greatly in the next few years. All I am asking you as policymakers, and as someone who has worked with many of you, is let's get it right, let's make sure it encompasses as broadly as we can, and then second and thirdly, is you have an enforceable way to do this, which is up to the standards of Minnesota, which has always historically been a right, a private right of action in law, whether it be modeled after the ones I suggested, only maybe for parts of the disclosure, that's a, a choice for discussion. We may not come to that today. Finally, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee were very much aware of how law enforcement and a number of entities want this data in the third parties, whatever it may be, whether it be Ancestry, 23andMe, or the laboratory that's now offering, hey, we can tell you about your genetic kind of information, uh, which is only in, in, in a non-health way, law enforcement and then he's uh, going to go there. Now, I see the amendment that was being offered by somebody that says law enforcement. I, that's great. That's one of the points that I've been talking about. But I think it's important that when you talk about a court order and search warrant, search warrant should be tied when law enforcement uses it. I'm not interested to see law enforcement use a court order at a possible lower standard. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I thank you much for the time that you have given me. This is a big deal, and it's, again, when you're old, 
one of the things that I was involved in with was our first genetic law, protection law, other than DNA in 89, was uh, Charlie Weaver and Jean Miriam. We were one of the first states to say you cannot discriminate against someone based on their DNA. And it was a bipartisan effort. And I think we have to rise to some of those standards here for some of those protections and all that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neumeister, for your testimony. <coughs> you can be around in case anyone has any questions. I trust you'll stick oh, yeah. around. All right, uh, Twyla Brace, you signed up to testify as well. Come on forward. Go ahead and identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have something to pass out to the committee. My name is Twyla Bray, Citizens Council for Health Freedom, and thank you for this opportunity to testify before you on what's really a very important issue. So, um, let me see, I just took some little notes in here. Okay, one thing I'm going to just start out with, as, rep uh, as uh, he'd like that, as Richard Neumeister uh, just set up here, is about three, 13.386. 13.386 is the genetic privacy law in our state. And if this bill would become law, that law will not uh, protect any more or allow any of the penalties under 13.386 to be in effect. Because what that law says is if there's any other language anywhere in law that has something to do with genetic information, that state law on genetic privacy and the right to uh, have uh, civil action and the right for penalties, all of that is gone. So I would just draw your attention to that law to, as something to think about. Now, when it comes to um, the bill itself and the language of the bill, I'm going to point out that an international group of our researchers in 2013 found that really there's no such thing as anonymized DNA. And it was a shock to the world, but uh, there it is. And so with all of that in mind, I'm just gonna address the bill to say that our con concerns begin on line 1.13 with a definition of de-identified data. So the only standard of de-identification that I see in this bill is the word reasonably, which lacks a definition. So exactly what identifiable information must be removed? Then in addition, on lines 1.15 to 1.20, um, to prevent re-identification, there's a reliance on public commitment and contracts to not re-identify, which of course all of that can only be enforced if it's actually found to have taken place. So I don't believe that the language uh, is sufficient to enforce the requirement. And again, it takes away all the state penalties having to do with our state genetic privacy law, which is a great law. Um, okay, the lack of specifics is even more concerning because line 2.25 states that genetic data, and I just ask you to listen to this very carefully, genetic data does not include de-identified data. So this, this definition of genetic data virtually guts the bill. The words genetic data appear 20 times in this bill, meaning 20 instances without privacy protection for the consumer's de-identified DNA. And as those researchers in 2013 found, you can't really anonymize DNA. So Senate file 1138 is really, and we know that this is the intent of the bill, and we have told the author we really appreciate the intent of the bill to protect genetic privacy, but as far as we're concerned, uh, this bill is supposed to be about giving consent rights to patients over their DNA, but as we see it, those who want to use a consumer's DNA without consent will simply strip off some information, we don't even know which one, what information, call it de-identified, and then be able to do whatever they want. To protect consumer privacy, we believe line 2.25 should be deleted. All right, now I'm just going to note the definition of persons on line 2.29. This is a long list of businesses and companies that can have access without the consumer's consent if some non-specified standard of de-identification is met. At that point, the consumer has no say in the matter of how it's used, how it's stored, how it's shared, or anything. We are also concerned about the notification policies for consent, line 2.13 
states that express consent means a consumer's affirmative response to a clear, meaningful, and prominent notice. Is this a written and informed consent? What is an affirmative response? Does it require companies to provide information on the fact that consumers have no consent rights regarding their de-identified de data? Does it tell them what de-identified data means or the fact that it's not protected from law enforcement? Although I have seen the amendment, and, um, and I like the sound of the amendment regarding law, uh, law enforcement. Um, and then despite lines 4.5 and 4.6, uh, uh, is it clear, in, in, in our opinion, even though you can delete the data, you won't be able to delete the data that's already been shared with all of these other companies and entities on that line for the definition of persons. So we strongly agree with given, giving consumers privacy and consent rights over their DNA, and we're pleased with the intent of this bill. We've been a long proponent of genetic privacy. However, as this bill stands with protections only for a subset of the consumer's DNA, we do not believe it actually protects consumers' genetic privacy, and we are concerned that such a law would convince consumers that they have privacy when they actually do not. Thank you for your time and attention to these concerns. Thank you, Ms. Brace. Appreciate that. Uh, Senator Klein, um, um, I guess first thing I want to do is we want to offer your author's amendment. My apologies, Mr. Chair. Right, That's what so, I was just about to do. I, so I, let's do that. Senator Umuver okay. Baton moves uh, the A1 amendment as the author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Um, second, we want to, uh, I'd like to hear um, Mr. Engelhardt's responses to the concerns that have been raised uh, by Mr. Neumeister and by Ms. Brace, and then um, we can take it from there. Sure. And I'll start with the issue of de-identification, because that one, uh, a little bit technical, but I think it's pretty straightforward once we understand what actually happens within the company. So if we have the consumer's personal information and run a test for them, that data is obviously identifiable. There's really no way that we de-identify the data of our consumers within the context of our service. The safe harbor for de-identification tracks directly to the FTC's standards for de-identified data. And what this allows, if you opt into research with one of our companies, for example, we can use external de-identified data without the provisions of this bill required, kicking in. Um, which makes sense if you think about it. If we receive de-identified data from the University of Utah, for example, to do research in conjunction with data that we have that is identifiable, how would we get consents from individuals that we are contractually foreclosed from re-identifying that information? So we have their A's, T's, C's, and G's. We might have some other um, phenotypic information about that data, but we don't know who it belongs to. We're not allowed to find out who it belongs to, and we're using it in conjunction with data sets that we have that is identifiable. So this is the same structure that you see in clinical trials with pharmaceutical companies. Um, it is the same standard that you find in the common rule, uh, both in the US and internationally for de-identification standards, and it provides that safe harbor so that de-identified data can be used in these research projects, and there is a clear public scientific value to that. Um, on the issue of the private right of action, um, I'm happy to look up the, the rest of the Minnesota statutes that were covered, but traditionally private rights of action um, in privacy law are for things like data breach. Um, we don't oppose a private right of action for genetic information in the context of a data breach law. In fact, we've actually supported that in a handful of states over the years. Um, in general, we do not like to see broad private rights of action for DTC genetic testing companies simply because the data is not solely within our system and not transferable to other places. Our consumers, because they pay for the test, have the ability to download their data at any time, and they can take it anywhere they choose. That means they can give it to another company to do further analysis if they want to find out more information that that company says they can provide based on their ancestry results. They can enter it into GEDmatch, which is the database that has been commonly used by law enforcement for investigative genetic genealogy searches. So if the consumer has a reason to believe that their data has been used improperly, they might most commonly associate that with the company that did the test, but they also could have taken that data to several other places. And with a Commerce Department enforcement, that allows us to say, hey, we've actually looked up this account that's in question in the complaint, and we can tell you that it was downloaded on a date and time certain. There may be more than one 
entity in play here if in fact the data was used improperly. So there hasn't been a single state that's passed a broad privacy act um, that has a private right of action. California's Consumer Privacy Rights Act has a limited private right of action, again, for data breach. On the genetic information side, Wyoming has a structure that is a little bit unique, um, mostly because they have no enforcement agencies. Um, so there was a strong right to cure put in the Wyoming law before a case could be brought to court so that again, if we're in this situation where it's unclear who improperly used the data, there's some way that we can figure that out before we go running in and, and talking to a judge. Um, of the other five states that have passed this, we've had no enforcement actions since this law has been on the books. Um, Illinois is another example of a state that has a private right of action. They have two laws there. One's the Biometric Info Privacy Act and the other's the Genetic Info Privacy Act that date back to 2008. Um, that was before either company even offered a DTC genetic testing product. Um, 23andMe has never had an action brought against them in Illinois. We have had a couple um, that were the result um, of an ownership change where plaintiffs asserted that, well, you were bought by private equity, you must have transferred the genetic information. Took us a lot of time and a lot of court resources to figure out that the, the claims were not merited. So we would much rather see a state agency enforce it because we can deal with folks um, directly. We can have it be a more collaborative process to figure out if there is a breach of privacy rights, what exactly happened, and, and get to the bottom of it without having it be an adversarial and expensive process. Could you also address uh, the question that Mr. Neumeister raised about whether the lab is covered and service providers or contractors? So any third party is covered. So we actually have to explain. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, any third party that would be receiving the data would fall under the separate express consent. So we actually have to explain that the, the data is processed by a third party lab. Um, and I have all of our consent flows that I can share with every member of the committee in PowerPoint so that you can see the exact questions that are asked to a consumer in the process. And what about the ability to revoke consent that has been given? So that's specifically in the bill. We have to have a process for a consumer to delete their data, close their account without additional steps. Um, that is in this bill. Can you point that out for me? Page four, Mr. Mr. Chair. So lines 4.5 and 4.6. So um, <clears throat> I asked counsel to look into the question that Ms. Brace had raised about chapter 13. Um, Ms. Primo, have you had a chance to take a look at that? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, the statute cited by um, Ms. Brace is 13.386. And it applies to government entities, but it also applies to any other person who um, collects genetic information. And it specifically says, um, unless otherwise expressly provided by law, so this bill would be that express permission, um, a government entity or any other person may only collect this information with the written informed consent of the individual and it lists several other requirements. So um, it is, I haven't looked at this statute and the bill in detail, but yes, there could be some conflict there um, in terms of um, this, this, this bill um, replacing or conflicting with that current law statute. And Ms. Primo, if that were the case, then it would remove the Chapter 13 remedies from uh, availability to any aggrieved consumer. Is that right? Ms. Mr. Ms. Chair and members, yes, that would be my reading of it. Again, I'm not sure if, if there are specific conflicts between the two requirements. I haven't sat down and looked through it, but yes, this would be that express permission. So whereas under current law, 
you might be subject to 13.08 and 13.09. This, this provision is only, um, has the commissioner's enforcement action only. Uh, so Ms. Primo, if, if a person felt they'd been wrongfully treated, their data hadn't been managed in accordance with uh, their consents, um, their remedy would be to contact the Department of Commerce and ask them to look into it? Ms. Primo? Mr. Chair and members, yes. Under, under this bill, that's correct. It's the commissioner who has that, that ability to enforce um, a violation of this statute and impose civil penalties. And so, Mr. Engelhardt, um, the, uh, Mr. Neumeister noted that there were not only Chapter 13, but the Health Records Act and the Fair Information Insurance Act as well that do provide private rights of action. Uh, um, are you able to uh, elaborate on how this is different than those? Maybe you don't know those other statutes in Minnesota that well, but I can uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I do, I'm not familiar with those other statutes in Minnesota. Mr. Um, I would be happy to look at those and see if they're limited to data breach or other things where we typically have seen private rights of action in place. Um, and if they're limited to HIPAA covered data, because the HIPAA privacy rule would kick in for the majority um, of how that data is treated. Um, so typically in the, the state setting, HIPAA covers what you can and can't do with someone's personal information. And then the states come in and, and offer a private right of action if there's a breach of that data. We have another testifier's approach to the table. Mr. Carlson, you have something to add to this discussion? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul. And I've been watching this on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice. And I know I have the right to remain silent, but sometimes I lack the ability. And uh, Senator Klein has asked us to speak a little bit about the right of action. Um, and uh, uh, just want the committee to know that we do have a uh, common law right uh, for invasion of privacy in Minnesota. It was recognized in 1998 uh, <coughs> through a case called Lake versus Walmart that happened in my hometown in Moorhead. Uh, and so we do have a remedy if they breach our privacy with this information. Um, and, um, um, and so when when asked if we needed to add that into this uh, particular law, I think we would, uh, you know, we would say we maybe don't need to do that, um, given what we know about the industry. Uh, to my knowledge, Mr. Chair and members, there isn't a private right of action in the Minnesota Health Records Act, and I'd kind of like to see one, but I don't believe it's there right now. Uh, and uh, but I do think that uh, the points that Ms. Brace made about 13.386 is valid, and and I think. Senator Klein would like to maybe try and figure that one out to make sure we're not um, eliminating those protections. But as to the private right of action, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to add to this account because we think that it is um, uh, existing law right now. And as Senator Seberger mentioned yesterday, it would be an American rule case, right? Every side would pay their own costs. And while we may at some point want to visit whether or not there's conduct here that would require a fee shift, we don't think that that's present right now based on what we know uh, on this industry. Happy to answer questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Um, has any of this conversation raised any questions or comments from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few years ago, the uh, data, pra data Privacy Legislative Data Practices Commission uh, began to study uh, the tactics and the procedures of genetic testing companies, especially when it was discovered that some of them were sharing DNA information outside of their uh, request by that individual. And uh, we never really got to the end of it. Uh, our uh, year came to a close, and then we ran into uh, the COVID years. And so it's been a while since we've visited this issue uh, as you know, that commission acts more during non-election years. So during election years, 
everyone's busy campaigning and we don't have a, <coughs> as a disciplined focus on data practice. Um, there was a lot of interest in what genetic testing companies actually do with the information and, and whether or not there's limitations. Uh, we were assured by some representatives of corporations that uh, they did not share, and others uh, uh, never gave testimony, nor were they requested. Uh, it was more of an open-ended hearing. <clears throat> the question I have is the uh, talk about uh, private rights of action. Uh, it seems like it's limited to breach, uh, but are there any references to misuse or um, uh, use without the permission of the subject? And um, are we addressing that in any way here today, or can someone address that, uh, the misuse of data, and how how is the subject or how is the individual assured that that would not be misused or used without the permission of the subject. Senator Klein. I, th I think I would defer to my testimony. Yeah, Mr. so the, the enforce, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the enforcement um, would be through commerce under section 45027. I'm not familiar with the particulars of what the penalties are in that, but we can definitely find that. Mr. Carlson. Mr. Chairman, Senator Limmer, I, I would view the types of misuse of your information as an invasion of my privacy. On the civil side, I would take it as a, a civil remedy. Mm -hmm. Chapter 47, um, uh, uh, 027 provides investigative power to the Commissioner of Commerce, Enforcement Authority, Injunctive Relief. Uh, he can impose a fine of up to $10,000 per um, uh, per violation of this act. There are probably a couple other commerce issues uh, related uh, in the bill um, that you know could maybe uh, use a little more clarity, but that is what their authority is. And they can uh, uh, also uh, uh, issue a cease and desist order to the company if they've um, violated uh, uh, their operating uh, parameters. Senator Lemmer, and then Mr. Neumeister also wants to add something. Yeah. Senator Lemmer. Uh, Thank you, um, Mr. Carlson. Um, the way you understand that process is, is a cause of action only limited through the commissioner. Can an individual file a private, private action? Mr. And Carlson. In, Mr. Chairman, Senator Limmer, be our just understanding that an individual could file a, an invasion of privacy private cause of action, but the commissioner's remedy uh, is not um, uh, is limited to their authority. They can't uh, proceed on behalf of the uh, aggrieved individual. They only have their authority, and that does not extend to any other party. It's only the commissioner. I don't want to speak for the commissioner, but that's you know if they if they if they find a company uh, ten thousand dollars, that goes to the state. It doesn't go to an aggrieved uh, consumer. Mr. Neumeister, you had something you wanted to add to this question? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I just want to react to the statement about the common law of privacy, which was recognized by the Supreme Court. I'm very familiar with that, but it's a very high standard of common law, of process statements, and recognizes the four. But again, for any individual, it's a very high standard, which is different than the statutory rights of action that have been developed on some of the issues of privacy that you as policymakers have done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Neumeister. Any other question or discussion from members of the committee? Sure. I see Ms. Brace also wants to add something. Why don't you come on forward if you wish, and we'll ask Senator Limmer, go ahead with your question while Ms. Brace comes forward. Okay, Ms. Brace, go ahead. 
Mr. Chair, again, Twyla Bray, Citizens Council for Health Freedom. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to say about the, the comment that was made about the de-identification de standard being according to the common rule. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the year that the federal government decided to do this, but they allowed specimens to be connected with a number that allowed re easy re-identification should that occur. And I remember the reports at the time where the researchers themselves were surprised that they were given that kind of ability to potentially link back. And so when you're looking at the common rule for federal research as though it is like this really high standard that you could never have somebody's privacy breached, I think you know even knowing that the researchers back there when they were talking about biological specimens, that's what this was all about, that they were surprised with the leniency that they'd been given by the federal regulators. Thank you, Ms. Brace. Senator Limmer. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to dig into another part of the bill. Uh, going back to 2.25, genetic data does not include <coughs> de-identified data. Um, is there a process of how to de-identify this data? How does that work? Mr. Engelhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, there are a lot of standards around de-identification of genetic data. I am admittedly not an expert on that. I was not aware that that was going to be raised as an issue today. It actually has not come up in other states where this bill has um, progressed. Uh, that said, I can absolutely bring a data scientist next time who can explain exactly how that process works and what the safeguards are that are in place. Mm. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator sir, um, there was a reference that this line should be taken out of the bill. How would that affect this bill? The intent of the bill. Mr. Thank Engelhardt. you, Mr. Chair and members. It, f for us, it would foreclose any company from using de-identified data in the process of research, right? Because if we take de-identified data from a third party and bring it into the DTC company, mm -hmm. then all the provisions in the bill kick in for that de-identified data. And we can't get consent from people that were contractually foreclosed from re-identifying. Right, so there's that chicken egg problem. It's de-identified, we can't know who they are, we can't make an attempt to know who they are, yet this bill says we would have to have express consents from them in order to use those de-identified data sets in research. Um, for Ancestry, we don't have any current research programs. We have done research programs in the past, um, typically with the University of Utah, that study how different genes have migrated across the globe over time. 23andMe has a very robust research program. About 80% of their participants opt in for that. Um, and they have actually made some interesting discoveries about the genetic cause of disease. And they've made those discoveries with the use of the data they have from their consumers, as well as de-identified data that's been brought in from, from third parties and research partners at universities. So that de-identified data language, it tracks to what's in the common rule, it tracks to the FTC standard, it tracks to HIPAA. Um, there's an understanding in the research community that we do our best to make sure that Joe Citizen happens to get this data in their hands that they can't re-identify it. Um, the companies have to you know, promise to not make re-identification attempts. They have to make steps to make it harder to re-identify. But the value of de-identified data in human subject research is huge. Um, so there's, there would be a, a cost to basically setting that aside from the bill because the companies would no longer be able to use that data in their research. Mr. Chair, um, let me go back a little bit further into the patient, uh, not patient, the consumer mm -hmm. of, a, of a product wishing to find their, their ancestral identity. Uh, does, do these companies uh, create an opt-in for the research, research sharing element, uh, or do they have an opt-out? So, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. All of the consents are opt-in. So you are not included in a research set unless you have opted in for that when you sign up. And then you also have to do the informed consent for any project. So um, it's that higher threshold. And informed consent is basically governed by the common rule. We have to explain the, the benefits and the potential risks of participating in the research, what the research is attempting to accomplish. Um, so that the consumer knows what they're getting into if they do decide to participate in, in that research. And Mr. Chair, as you, as you previously stated on 
line 4.6 that a consumer can request and obtain the destruction of their biological mm -hmm. sample. Yep. Now, the sample may be destroyed, but can one digitally uh, have a copy of it or a representation of it for research purposes? And is that destroyed as well? Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair and members. So there's actually two prongs in this, where we have to have a process to uh, delete the genetic data and destroy the biological sample. So if they request that we delete the data and destroy the sample, there's nothing left for us to, to pull that data back once it's been deleted. Um, so they are in control of whether their sample stays in our system um, and they're in warehouses. So that's why we have a little bit of a longer window to destroy those. We actually have to go pull the tray and physically destroy the sample. The data is deleted much faster when a, a data deletion request come in. So Mr. Chairman, um, where would it be here where, where the uh, data record of the sample would be destroyed? Can you point to that in this legislation? Mr. Engelhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Remember, so that's lines 4.4 and, I'm sorry, 4.5 and 4.6. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see a so, reference on 4.5 of genetic data. <coughs> I don't see genetic data in 4.6. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, 4.6 deals with the request to destroy the biological sample, and then the line before deals with the request to destroy the data. So if you de destroy the data in the sample, we have, we have no biological information or genetic information about that consumer anymore. And Mr. Chair, does the Senator consumer Lemmer. know that they have this right to destroy that sample? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, it's in our privacy policies. It's required by this bill to be in the privacy policies. And is it in the so contract me, that the consumer uh, requests this, this product? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Yes, it's also in our terms of service, which is the contract between the company and the consumer. Um, these opt-ins are all presented at the start of the relationship um, with the caveat that they can revoke their consents. Um, so they're in control from start to finish. And even for other consents that we haven't talked about, if you opt in to see genetic relatives and you decide that you don't like that feature, you can immediately turn that off in settings. Um, so some of the consents can be revoked immediately through the settings. Some of them, like destroying a biological sample or destroying data that's in the system, you have to you know, contact the company through the website, but that process is in place and it's clearly described. Both companies have privacy centers that are interactive that anyone can access. So if you want to know this information before you even purchase a kit, it's all available online. It's explained in easy to understand English. Um, some of the topics have videos where scientists actually come on and explain what the privacy considerations are. Senator Hall. Thank you, Chair Lass. The question I have is, does the consumer get verification or notified is the time and date that the genetic data and uh, the biological sample are destroyed? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I actually Mr. need to Engelhardt. check on that. Um, I, I'm, I believe that, that there's an automated process that when the sample is destroyed, it notifies the consumer on the email we have on file, but I need to verify that. Senator Hall. Uh, thank you. And is... Uh, when, if the company updates its policy on, on this, is the, is the, as that changes, as it, I would have to believe time, as time, we all, all companies change their policies, mm -hmm. is the consumer then given that change notice and another opportunity to opt out and, and request data destru destruction? Mr. Engelhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. We notify our consumers if we ever update our terms of service or privacy policies. Um, that is a regular process. As you can imagine, with more and more states passing privacy laws, uh, there are things that we need to update privacy policies, terms of service in order to conform. We notify the consumers in that notification. Um, they are made aware that they can delete their data and, and leave the company. Senator Howell. Any other questions or discussion from the committee? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
just one last question about this de-identified data. I guess to me, it, the relevant inquiry that I see is who is de-identifying the data. In the first example you gave earlier, you talked about the data coming to your company or mm -hmm. 23andMe already essentially de-identified. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. But it's quite a different thing if you're the company that's doing the de-identify. It seems like there's much more of cause for concern in those situations uh, because you have access to re-identify it where you, it's much more difficult in the former example. Um, so, I mean, would this definition in this bill include both scenarios I just referenced? Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Yes, and I, I believe when we're dealing with the company that has the first party relationship that processed the test that has the data, um, you can reasonably assume that they know who the data belongs to, right? So I think the de-identification standard would apply if we were, again, sharing that data externally and de-identifying it, which the companies don't do. Um, it really is for de-identified data that is used in research sets that are inbound. Not seeing any further discussion, uh, S Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if we've uh, completely answered the question about the potential conflict with Chapter 13 that Ms. Brace brought forward. And I don't know if we can at this particular time. Um, is it your intent to move the bill without answering that question, Mr. Chair? Uh, Senator Limmer, it is my intent to move the bill. Um, I'm satisfied uh, that there's enough clarity that this probably pulls it out of Chapter 13, but that there is a private cause of action for invasion of privacy um, that does provide a remedy. I don't know the, the standards exactly on the thresholds for that, but as, as far as I'm concerned, if there's a private cause of action, I guess I'm satisfied. Okay. As to that, because otherwise the Chapter 13 would be the, the vehicle for providing for a lawsuit by an aggrieved consumer. So as long as we have a vehicle for that available, I'm, I'm comfortable. All right. For what it's worth. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'll uh, put an invite out to uh, Senator Klein uh, to continue this discussion. I'm not entirely satisfied yet, uh, but I want to uh, continue working with the chief author. Uh, there's got to be a reason why other states have added to this and that it's um, not included, at least in their provisions. And uh, I need to do a little more research on that before I would give this bill my blessing. Uh, Senator Klein, council has written up some language that might address this. So while we have it here, um, this is not the kind of thing I think we really want to deal with on the f either in Commerce Committee since it's a Chapter 13 issue or on the floor. So why don't we suggest this language and see what you think about it. Is that okay? Uh, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and, and members, I'll, I'll preface this with saying I'm not going to call this like comfort language or a technical amendment because it, it, it potentially does have some substantive effect that perhaps um, some of the parties may not um, it, you know, be interested in. But um, so I'll read the language, which would be at page four um, after line 12. Insert this section does not supersede the requirements and rights described in section 13.386 or the remedies available under Chapter 13 for violations of Section 13.386, um, period. So the intent of this language would be to preserve whatever um, potential violations of law there may be under current law in Chapter 13 and make those remedies available for a violation of that section. So it would not, so, so hopefully providing clarity that this does not um, change current law remedies. So Ms. Primo, then the, the remedies in 13.08 and 13.09 would then be available to a consumer? Mr. Chair and members, not for any violations that would fall under this bill, but it would preserve potential violations that would be addressed 
under 13.386. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Senator, Mr. Carlson. I'm going to consult with the doctor. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, uh, I won't speak for Senator Klein, but as far as the concern that was raised, I think it keeps chapter 13, your language keeps chapter 13 completely separate. This new section of law deals with our private genetic testing and doesn't at all impact the uh, genetic testing and information that the government holds. So I think that fixes what the concern was. That would be my response. Actually, it, it looks like Chapter 13.386 doesn't only address government data. It also addresses data held by any person. It's, it's kind of an odd provision in the Data Practices Act, but it seems to be broader than just the government data. Is that correct, Ms. Primo? Mr. Chair and members, yes. It classifies the genetic data that's held within a government entity as private data, so that only affects the government entity. But then it says that unless otherwise expressly provided by law, a government entity or any person, which includes um, private organizations, um, must also follow the requirements listed there, which includes um, getting written, written informed consent, among a few other things. Senator Klein, your thoughts on the language that has been drafted as a possible amendment? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Ms. Primo for suggesting the language. Thank you also to the lawyer support for a doctor here from the committee and from Mr. Carlson. I uh, you know the doctors turn to lawyers frequently for uh, support. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, gratefully accept that as a friendly amendment if offered by one of your members. Senator, Clinton, Senator Limmer, would you like to offer that language as an amendment? Mr. Chairman, I move the... Uh, Oral amendment as described by council. Does anyone need us to repeat the terms of the oral amendment? Ms. Primo, would you please read it again? Mr. Chair and members, um, page four, line 12, after line 12, insert, this section does not supersede the requirements and rights described in section 13.386 or the remedies available under chapter 13 for violations of section 13.386. Um, Mr. Chair and members, if I could also have a technical cor correction instruction just to insert some paragraphs. So that is the amendment. Senator Limmer, is that the amendment you're offering? It is. So moved, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion on this amendment? Not seeing any. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment and the motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Is there any further discussion on uh, Senate file 1138 as amended? Senator Seberger. Yes. Mr. Chair, I move that Senate File 1138, as amended, be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Commerce Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Senator Klein, it's coming to your committee now. So, Senator Gustafson, why don't you come on forward? We'll do Senate File 294. And uh, also, uh, for those of you who are here for Senate File 133, the labor trafficking bill, I clearly bit off more than I could chew on this agenda, and I sincerely apologize. <coughs> we are just clearly not going to be able to get to that bill on today's agenda. 
So I'm very sorry for that. Uh, we are going to reschedule it for next Monday, February 13th, um, so that you know when you can return uh, for that bill. Um, I, honestly, I did not anticipate the first bill would take us over an hour. So um, we just have to make the adjustment on the fly here. So uh, we're going to strike Senate File 133 from the agenda today. Um, it's my hope we can complete the rest of the agenda, but I guess we'll just have to see how the discussion goes. Um, Senator Gustafson, Senate File 294. Go ahead and make your presentation on the bill. Mr. Chair and members, thank you very much. I'm here with Senate File 294. This bill corrects some language in our stat, uh, statute around surreptitious intrusion. And I also want to thank uh, those of you who have co-authored the bill. Many of you are on this committee today, and I appreciate your support. The crime of surreptitious intrusion uh, currently does not apply to an activity that does not take place through a window or aperture establishment, uh, meaning that if someone uses their phone, for example, to record you without your clothes on, without your consent, while you're asleep, for example, it's not necessarily illegal. So the bill stems from the McReynolds case. McReynolds admitted to using his cell phone to record a woman while she was naked in her bed without her consent and knowing that she likely would not have consent McReynolds and a woman went on a first date. Following the date, McReynolds and the woman traveled to her apartment. He stayed the night. The next day, the woman contacted the police. She told officers that McReynolds had naked pictures, pictures of her. Um, the woman also reported she had previously told him that she would not send him naked pictures. Um, but during the subs uh, subsequent investigation, officers interviewed McReynolds. McReynolds admitted he took nude video of the woman and he intentionally hid his actions so that she would not object. Again, this bill would establish the crime of surreptitious intrusion that does not take place through a window or an aperture. Um, it would also establish this crime under or around a person's clothing and amends the statute of limitations for the crime of surreptitious intrusion to three years after the offense or after the victim has reported the incident to law enforcement. I am ready to move forward with testifiers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Uh, go ahead. I see a testifier with you. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. My name is Madeline Pung, and I'm here before you today to share my story and shed light on the importance of amending the current interference with privacy language under Minnesota Statute 609.746, as well as the statute of limitations for such crimes under Minnesota Statute 628.26, as proposed in Senate File 294. Unbeknownst to me, my personal story of victimization and exploitation occurred on April 22, 2018. On that date, nearly five years ago, I accepted an offer from a childhood friend to tour his pig farm in Olivia, Minnesota. I viewed this as a novelty experience. I was told that I would need to shower because of biohazard requirements, meaning by law, one must shower in and shower out of hog farms to control um, to prevent contamination and the spread of illness. So I did as told and continued with the tour, never having thought about it again until May 3rd, 2021. This was the date that my sense of security was ripped away from me and the definition of betrayal took on a new meaning. On this day, an article published by the West Central Tribune was sent to me. The link was titled, Olivia Mann alleged to have filmed women in the shower at his hog barn. I read the article multiple times, just to make sure I was understanding it correctly. 23 videos and 104 still images were surreptitiously taken of naked women showering at his farm without their knowledge or consent between October 30th, 2016 and December 12th, 2019. I felt physically ill and emotionally traumatized because I knew at that moment that I was the victim of a sexually motivated crime. I had no idea of the emo emotional roller coaster path that lay before me, nor did I understand the gravity that it would have on my mental health. By the next morning, I was in contact with the lead investigator on the case. My identity and involvement in the matter was confirmed after the investigator sent me a cropped screenshot of my face from the illicit footage. That picture haunts me. I look at it and I know it's me, but it doesn't feel like me. I've been told that that is a coping mechanism, my brain's way of processing a traumatic experience. 
In this same conversation, I learned that, that the predator used the same method of operation in committing each and every one of his crimes. He waited until each victim was showering off, wherein he simultaneously snuck outside, climbed up a ladder, watched and filmed me naked through an egress style window. And I was just one of 17 women that he did this to. What further compounded this traumatization was what I learned next. My case would not be included in the charges brought against my perpetrator under Minnesota Statute 609.746 because of the three-year statute of limitations for interference with privacy, which had expired just eight calendar days before discovering that I was the victim in this predatory scheme. And I want to emphasize that. The deadline for pressing criminal charges passed before I even knew that I was the victim of a crime. In fact, only six of the 17 women in this case were protected and considered chargeable offenses in Minnesota. Meanwhile, 11 women have been left to deal with the ongoing consequences of this predator's actions and without their day in court, all due to the inadequate language in the statute of limitations for interference with privacy. Now, while a life wasn't lost, something tangible, intangible yet profoundly valuable had been. My sense of security and trust have been irreparably shattered, and my grief is further compounded by the fact that receiving justice for my case and those that occurred before mine is impossible. Holding my perpetrator accountable in criminal court for the crimes he committed against me and others is not an option, and an opportunity that the law is supposed to afford us. It has forced me to rethink what justice looks like and compelled me to pay attention to where the law falls short. There are major flaws in the law we are re-examining today, and I want to be very explicit. The statute of limitations for interference with privacy expires before many victims even know that they are victims of a crime, thereby perpetuating re-victimization. It is egregious that a criminal may not be held accountable for a crime they commit because they were able to go undetected long enough for the statute of limitations to run out while the trauma that victims experience has no expiration date. It is imperative that we make the proposed amendments in Senate File 294 to be more inclusive with consideration to technological advancements and reflect a more equitable and reasonable window for victims to seek justice. The victims of invasion of privacy crimes deserve a voice beyond the current statute of limitations three-year limit, with, which starts upon the commission of the crime and should not unknowingly lose the opportunity to be heard, all because law enforcement had yet to discover the crime's existence until it was too late. I implore you to approve the revisions proposed today that allow indictments to be found or made and filed within three years after the commission of the offense, or three years after the offense was reported to law enforcement authorities. It is worthy of your consideration and vote. This amendment will have po a positive impact on countless victims and negate the emotional distress that occurs when victims perceive the door has been closed on them. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Pong. Appreciate your testimony. Let's see if we have one more testifier approaching. Are you Ms. Altman? Please go ahead and identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary and Public Committee. My name is Lainey Altman, and I am here to also share my story and personally attest to the enormous value of amending the current interference with privacy language, along with the statute of limitations language as proposed in Senate File 294. My story began similar to that of the 16 other victims who were also sexually exploited when we were secretly recorded naked in a shower by the same man. Where 11 of our stories differentiate, however, was a journey through the justice system. When we learned of our inability to hold this per predator accountable in criminal court. In January of 2018, I was invited to join my older sister and her then best guy friend to tour his hog farm. At the time, I was only 19 years old, and hanging out with my older sister and her friends was something I looked forward to and cherished. This time was no exception. He was a brother figure who was not blood, but he was family in my eyes. I was intrigued by this new experience and excited to spend time with both of them. Upon arrival to the farm, I learned of the biohazard requirements mentioned before and was told I would need to shower in and out. I vividly remember the bright fluorescent lights, which immediately made me feel uneasy. I recall realizing that my sister was about to see every piece of my body, imperfections and all. It never dawned on me that my body would be on view for anyone else. 
I left that night with an unrecognizable, unrecognizable discomfort that I had never felt before. It wasn't until just over three years later that I would recognize this to be my gut, my gut telling me something was very wrong. In April 2021, I received a phone call from my sister. Rumors were circulating in our hometown that her lifelong friend who owned the hog farm had been caught with videos and images of naked women showering at his hog farm without their consent or knowledge. Initially, I felt upset and exposed on behalf of those women. Then the realization that I may be involved set in as my sister's words said, Lainey, we went to the hog farm, this could be us. The following day, I received the dreaded phone call from the lead investigator on the case. My heart sank and my body went into shock as he shared his belief that it was me in one of the videos recovered. He asked me to confirm my identity via a screenshot of my face from footage in the shower during my visit at the hog farm. I almost didn't recognize myself. This had suddenly become very real. The comprehension of the predator's exploitation had sunk in. I struggled to put the pain and betrayal into words at just 19 years old, two years from being a mi minor. I think about how the only difference between 17-year-old Laney and 19-year-old Laney was a small number. I was still innocent enough to put trust in a man, a man that I had thought i known, a man that would intentionally record women for his own sex sexual gratification. I was still learning what it meant to be confident in my own body. I wanted it to be my choice who saw me at my most vulnerable moments, and this was unknowingly and without consent taken from me. On my continuous journey of healing, I've come to understand that the stages of grief are applicable beyond the loss of a life. Each has come with its own unique, long-lasting effects. The one I'm most struggling with is acceptance. As I've tried to find a definition of acceptance that reflects how I feel, they all fall short for me. How does one look at the statement, 23 videos and 104, 104 still images taken of naked women showering without their consent and accept that his actions weren't punishable for 11 of the 17 women due to the inadequate statute of limitations for invasion of privacy? I am not willing to accept the same fate for future victims. For 11 of us, our statute of limitations ran out before we even knew the crime committed against us. We never stood a chance to fight back and hold our perpetrator accountable in criminal court. Just as painful of a realization is that we are, no, we are not the only people who have fallen victim to secretive non-consensual recordings and lost the opportunity to press criminal charges, but we could be the last. By implementing the revisions in front of you today, Justice will not be brought to me and the 10 other victims in this case, but it will protect future victims and give them a seat at the prosecution table to hold their perpetrators accountable to their actions. We cannot let any more predators off the hook just because they were able to go undetected long enough for the three year statute of limitations to pass before anyone discovered their crime. These amendments will help victims fight the battle against exploitation and the advancements of technology that the law as is does not account for today. Well, I thought I wouldn't have to tell this story again. I'm appreciative to you all for taking the time to listen to myself and Madeline. I'm both hopeful and confident that sharing my story will aid your understanding of approving the amendments in Senate File 294 is of such importance. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. Great job. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Altman, uh, and again to Ms. Pung for sharing your stories with us. Uh, Senator Gustafson, uh, I don't see any uh, author's amendments in our packet. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Um, Chairman. So, uh, Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you for coming forward and sharing your story. And I think I've watched too many vigilante movies because I think I have some plans for that hog farmer. <laughs> Uh, Senator Gustafson, Council has taken a look at the effective date um, on page 10 of the bill and has a suggestion we'd like you to consider. Um, Mr. Chair and members, yes, I was just having a conversation with the chair. Uh, my recollection is in the past when we have broadened um, the um, statute of limitations that sometimes the legislature provides that it would apply also to crimes committed before the uh, expert. Uh, the effective date if the, the limitations period for the crime had not already expired. If you look at lines 10.18 uh, to 10.19, it explicitly only extends the statute of limitations for crimes committed after that date. So it, it would, would you like me to read it then? It's yes. Uh, so the possible amendment would be on um, line 10.19 uh, before the period insert and to crimes committed before that date 
if the limitations period for the crime did not expire before August 1, 2023. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Or I, I'm not Senator sure if there are a paper, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, oh, if there's a paper copy avail being printed or if you could just reread that to me again. Mr. Backus, go ahead and reread it, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, on page 10, line 19, before the period, insert end to crimes committed before that date if the limitations period for the crime did not expire before August 1st, 2023. Mr. Chair, Senator Gustafson. Um, I would approve that amendment. So we can actually treat this as an author's amendment since this is the bill's first hearing. Is there any? So if, if uh, Senator Gustafson would treat this as a friendly amendment, we'll do it as an author's amendment. Senator Seberg, care to move that? I'll uh, move the author's amendment um, as stated. Senator Seberg moves the author's amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Uh, to the bill, any uh, questions or Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to the testifiers and Senator Gustafson. Um, I, I agree that the statute of limitations definitely needs to be changed here. Um, I just have a question. It's probably for Senate Council. And um, I'm used to statute of limitations in civil contexts. And more common language would be three years after the person learns of the offense rather than three years after it's reported. But perhaps I understand this is a criminal case, so it's different because the charge comes from the state. But I'm just wondering if this is common language that we see in the criminal code about it being a certain amount of time after it's reported to law enforcement. Mr. Backus. Mr. Chair and Senator Kroon, um, my recollection is that we had similar language to this for the criminal sexual conduct cases against a minor victim. Uh, however, that language was superseded a few years ago when I think we made just all of them essentially no statute of limitations. I don't think there's any similar language to this remaining in this criminal statute of limitations. But again, I think there was that one instance. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Senate Council, I, I don't really have a problem with it reading this way if there is some precedent, um, although maybe the context is different if we were talking about minors. Um, I guess the, the only concern would be as if somebody knew about this for several years and didn't report it and then reported it and there's three years. But even then, I'm not sure that that's a problem because law enforcement didn't know about it until then. So I guess I just raised this question more for discussion um, than any particular objection. So I, I'm fine with the way it's drafted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess reading this, uh, I guess I would like to, to see, I see in here where someone could turn around and and ask for a uh, ask for their this felony the way I read this anyway on 6.21 and to 6.23 does that mean and when I read that does that mean on line 8.16 that somebody that that uh, had interference with privacy and a subsequent violation or a minor victim, they could actually get this expunged? Mr. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, yes, that's correct. That's current law. Um, the person would be eligible to petition for expungement. Of course, there's no guarantee the person would get an expungement. Uh, for that offense, among other listed felony offenses, the person would have to wait at least five years before the discharge of the sentence for that offense and could not have been convicted of a new crime during that period. 
So Thank Senator you. How that would mean after discharge means after probation has expired and they've been discharged. So whatever their incarceration is, if any, then probationary period, and then five years with no new crimes, mm -hmm. then they'd be eligible to petition for expungement. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't. I would like to see that hang on to them. So I'll offer the A3 amendment. I believe that's the amendment anyway. Am I correct on that, uh, Mr. Baskas? A the A two amendment. Okay, thank you. I just think that if, Mr. Chair, if, if I believe if, if the individual has done this, especially, I, I just think that this would stiffen it up and I don't, I'd like to see it stay on the record instead of having it expunged, Mr. Chair. So let me point out to members, uh, Line 8.166 is amended in the current bill, but that's just a conforming change uh, to, uh, with regard to the paragraph lettering. Um, what's being proposed is a significant change to our current expungement statute. Um, and uh, so I, quite candidly, that's a, in my mind, it's well, it's completely different than the bill in front of us. Now, we don't have a germaneness rule in committee, um, but uh, if there is going to be any action like that taken, I personally would prefer that we have a whole separate discussion and stakeholders that are interested in the expungement process um, and, and substance have an opportunity to participate in a legislative conversation about that rather than making a big substantive change like that uh, in the context of the bill that is in front of us. So um, I, I personally will be opposing the amendment for that reason alone um, in terms of process. Senator Howell, did you have something you wanted to add or any other discussion from members? Well, Mr. Chair, as long as we're, I just think someone that's uh, in violation of, uh, and, and that has, con done this conduct, uh, I don't think they should be able to get it off their record. So if it's, uh, to me, it should stay on their record, and it's, it's basically specifically with this privacy and a subsequent violation or with a minor victim, I don't think we should be allowing them to take it off their, their record, and it's only for felony violations. It's not for everything else. So if they've, con if they've been convicted of this offense in the felony form, why would, I want it, why would I want to give them the opportunity to get it expunged off their record and have a clean bill of health? I, I guess I have an issue with that. And I think uh, the folks that do this type of conduct, uh, they should own it. Senator Gustafson, there's been an, an amendment proposed uh, by Senator Howe here, the A2 <coughs> amendment. What is, as chief author, what is your position on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. While I appreciate the, the tough on crime message, I would like to keep the language that is already intact in this bill, and I would ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on the A2 amendment? Not seeing any all in favor. Mr. Say Chair, aye. I'd like to ask for a roll call on that vote. All right, there's been a roll call requested. There will be a roll call. Senator Cruen to the A2 amendment. Thank you. On the A2 amendment, I'd just like to remind members, all, we're only talking about offenders who are repeat offenders or where the victims were minors. That's what we're talking about here. I have uh, no real um, sympathy for those perpetrators. I don't really feel like they should have their records expunged in those kinds of cases. So I would absolutely support the A2 amendment. 
Senator Cruin, I'll just point you to the expungement statute, or all members, the expungement statute. It's explicitly stated that expungement is an extraordinary remedy, and there are 12 separate criteria that a judge uh, must consider before deciding whether to grant an expungement. But more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, hearing an amendment of this nature on this bill without any notice to others who are, have an interest in the expungement statute itself, to me, it would be a degradation of the legislative process. I would encourage Senator Howe to introduce a bill if he wishes to have that change made, but for that reason, I'd encourage a no vote on the amendment. There's been a roll call request, and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Latz? No. Senator Umu Verbaten? No. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Kroon? Yes. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Seeberger? No. Senator Westland? There being four votes in favor, six opposed, the amendment does not prevail. Is there any further discussion on uh, Senate File 294 as amended? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have, I have a question about uh, if there's an another place in statute that covers the uh, publication or um, uh, making, making public these uh, stills and videos that have been taken under this uh, because there evidently was a period of uh, a delay between the commission of the crime that we're talking about in this bill and the notification that the uh, the victim really was given by it being publicized. Do we have something that covers publication of these kinds of videos or stills? Mr. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair, members, I, I don't have the statute at my fingertips, but we have what is kind of known as the revenge porn crime. Uh, I don't, I, I'd ha you'd have to look, we'd have to look to see how applicable that might be, but that does cover this general conduct. And I, I don't know, it's possible there might be, a, I don't know what the civil cause, cause of action, if there's one for invasion of privacy, what the statute of limitations might be for that, but that might be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yep. Further, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion on Senate File uh, 294 as amended? Not seeing Senator Limmer. Members, we're going to keep the room here until 3 o'clock today and try to get through uh, what we have planned for the rest of the agenda. Senator Limmer. Thank you. To uh, the bill, please. Question to counsel. Do we have anything in criminal law where we, on statute of limitations, we recognize the point of knowledge that a person has been victimized? When it comes to criminal law, is there any provision of that? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator Limmer, if you're asking some, somewhat similar to maybe Senator Kroon's question, right. I, I, don't th I think the answer is no, to my knowledge. I, I don't think there's, for criminal law, a provision that, you know, that would trigger the statute of limitation once one becomes aware of the offense. Hmm. That's interesting. All right, thank you. Senator Kroon. Senator Limmer's comments are, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer's comments are, are kind of where my concern was. Uh, I think this is an unlikely scenario, but it's something that I think we need to think about where I totally understand about the statute of limitations not starting when the victim doesn't even know that they're a victim. That totally makes sense and is, an appro is appropriate, but this language is talking about reporting it to the law enforcement agency. I could think of an example where uh, the victim is aware of the conduct but doesn't report it to law enforcement and can sit on it for decades and then report it to law enforcement and there's still three years then left on the statute of limitations. And I, I'm just a little uncomfortable because the way that the language is worded, it's, it sets up a scenario where this could go on for decades and there really isn't a real statute of limitations if it isn't reported to law enforcement. I don't have an amendment in mind, but this language does concern me a little bit. I'm totally on board for extending the statute of limitations to not start until the victim realizes that they're a victim of this conduct, but 
I'm uncomfortable with this language as drafted, and but I don't have a particular amendment right now. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Yeah, um, I just had a, I had a quick question because I, I don't know how you document that you became aware of the crime. Will you tell your best friend? It seems to me with our, I would want to look at our current laws around sexual assault to see when the, when the time clock starts. I mean, I think we took away the statute of limitations there totally um, a few years ago. So I think it would start, though, it seems to me, when the crime is reported. I think that's probably more common because otherwise, how do you actually document it? Senator Crone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, in my my frame of reference is coming from civil suits, and that that's a question of fact in those civil suits. And so, what I'm looking for from counsel, and which is why I'm not presenting an amendment here, is just to make sure that it's in line with how we do the statute of limitations on other criminal conduct such as sexual assault. I mean, that's what I'm looking for to make sure that this is consistent with that. And if it is, then I'm satisfied. Um, but I'm just probing around a little bit just to make sure that we are being consistent here. So members, council has uh, provided some, uh, drafted some language as an alternative if we wish to consider it relating to the statute of limitations question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, members. And yeah, uh, again, just to confirm, um, up to a few years ago, uh, indictments or complaints for violations of the criminal sexual conduct laws and, I, and, and one other crime, I'm not aware of what it is. If, if the victim was under the 18, age of 18, it, could be, it would be within uh, nine years of when the commission of the offense or three years after the offense was reported to law enforcement. Again, that's been taking off the books. So um, a, a possible amendment could be on line 10.5 delete reported to law enforcement authorities and insert discovered by the victim. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Again, I don't exactly know um, how you are documenting discovered by the victim. I think since it's been before we repealed the statute of limitations on sexual assault, we had the three-year limit since it was reported to law enforcement. I just think it makes sense to keep that. Mr. Chair, could you just repeat for me what the proposed amendment might be? Senator Gustafson, yes. Uh, Mr. Backus. Um, there's no amendment that's been offered. Or just language? Point, I'll okay. tell you what the language might be, yes. Thanks. Senator Backus. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Backus. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. I'd like to move that Senate File 294 be recommended to pass. Sorry, as amended. Okay, with a motion on the table, we also have a request from the chief author to repeat the language that Mr. Backus had asked for. So, Senator Gustafson, do you um, wish to have that language repeated? I, no, Mr. Chair, I, I can ask him at another time, but I appreciate moving forward. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I made my motion. Roll call. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like a roll call. There will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Lax. Yes. Senator Umover Baton. Yes. Senator Limmer. Yes. Senator Carlson. Yes. Senator Eichhorn. Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Kroon? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Seeberger? Yes. Senator Westland? Yes. 
There being 10 votes in favor and none opposed, the motion prevails. Where did this go? Okay, Senate File 294 is heading to the Senate floor then. Senate File 1038, Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, members, um, I'm here now with Senate File 1038, which establishes payment of the cost of evidentiary examinations of victims, provision in cases involving domestic assault by strangulation. Data on strangulation reveals the severity of this type of assault. One in four women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And of those, up to 68% will suffer near fatal strangulation at the hands of their partner. Of the victims, 97% are strangled by hands, 38% reported losing consciousness, 35% are strangled during sexual assault and abuse, 9% are also pregnant, and 70% of strangled women believe they are going to die. State law already requires the cost of exams in criminal sexual conduct, conduct cases to be paid for by the county in which the uh, criminal sexual conduct occurred. These costs include the full cost of the rape kit exam, associated tests related to a victim's STI status and pregnancy status. The county may only seek insurance reimbursement from the victim's insurance if the victim gives permission, and that permission may only be asked for after the exam is performed. Victims must be informed the county is required by law to pay for the exam, and they are now in way liable for the costs. Costs must be covered regardless of whether the victim reports to law enforcement and is not dependent on the existence of statutes or uh, in, of any investigation or prosecution of the perpetrator. I am ready to move forward with testifiers, Mr. Chair, but I want to quickly say that as I know that this is being recorded and documented, it is important that anybody watching know that if they are in trouble, 1-800-656-HOPE, that's 1-800-656-4673 is the domestic abuse and sexual assault hotline available 24 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. I have uh, one testifier signed up, that was Brittany Miller. Is Ms. Miller here? Come on forward. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Brittany Miller. I am the Youth Sex Trafficking and Domestic Violence Regional Program Coordinator. I work for an agency named Women's Rural Advocacy Program, otherwise named RAP. RAP serves a four-county area, Redwood, Lyon, Lincoln, and Yellow Medicine County in southwest Minnesota. We provide client-led services. They can vary from legal assistance, housing assistance, medical assistance, and many other supportive services. There are many barriers for victims of domestic violence and strangulation victims. These also include medical costs that we're talking about today. Strangulation has what we call invisible injuries. These injuries are petechia that are spots that are bleeding underneath your skin that are often on the inside of your mouth. Victims often don't even know that these things exist. Um, as the senator addressed, strangulation can result in death, and a large percentage of victims of domestic violence have been strangled. The costs of, of medical, the mo medical costs of examinations that are due to strangulation um, can often make victims feel that they shouldn't have to get these in examinations based off the invisible injuries. This if the victims didn't have to pay for these services, it would lighten the burden that comes with this victimization. They often don't understand what the procedures are for reimbursement, and they often give up due, due to dealing with more immediate concerns, homelessness, a restructure of their family, and just the trauma that comes with domestic violence. It's as important as free sexual assault exams. We need to eliminate barriers for victims of domestic violence. This is worthy of your vote. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Senator Gustafson, did you have any other testifiers? No, that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Is there any discussion or questions from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. 
Mr. Chairman, I, I'm unaware of the history of, of uh, why evidence of strangulation would not be a collection of evidence that would be paid for by uh, an investigation. I, I'm really surprised that we even have it here, but if they don't pay for it, it should be included. But I, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised that we as a state or a law enforcement agency or prosecutor, wh whoever is responsible for tests, uh, wouldn't be paying for it. Is See if we can find an answer to your question, Senator yeah. Lemmer. Mr. Chair, Mr. Limmer, Senator, I would, or Senator Limmer, I would also just um, point out that there's probably several of laws that are like this that might surprise you when it comes to sexual assault and what is collected and what isn't. Um, but I'm going to let my testifier maybe speak to some of that history and help you out. Ms. Miller. Would you mind repeating your question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Limmer. I'm surprised that... Uh, the law enforcement or prosecutorial role of government doesn't pay for the examination for strangulation. Is this common in other states, or uh, how did we miss this? Do you, do you have any brief history on that? I, no. I can't speak to other states. I'm not <coughs> actually quite sure. Um, but there are other, like within domestic violence in general, there's often unpaid for medical expenses outside of strangulation. All right. Senator Lummer. No, I'm done. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to move that Senate File 1038 be recommended to pass. And Mr. Chairman, does it have to go to another committee? Uh, Senator Pappas, uh, no, it uh, goes to the floor. OK, and be referred to the floor. Thank you. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. I just got a question as, as to why we limit it to domestic assault and why it's not assault by strangulation to everybody. Why does it have to be a domestic situation? Why can't it be anybody that is assaulted by strangulation? Uh, is there, I, I'm just questioning why we limit it to domestic assault and it's not everybody that's assaulted by strangulation. I, I think we should be paying for it for everybody that's assaulted with the use of strangulation. That's my only question. Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I, I would agree. Um, I think the language in here is um, particular to certain instances where it might not be collected um, versus times where it might be more, um, more of protocol to have it collected. Um, I, again, I, nobody is, uh, wants to see more justice done for this than people who are survivors. Um, so I applaud that you are pushing forward for more of this. I would, um, and I might lean on counsel for this answer as well, but my guess is that in some, especially with domestic abuse, it is not always an obvious thing to look for, um, where in other cases it might be. Um, a lot. Gustafson Council has something to add. In Thank you. I I'm appreciate it. No. Nope. Um, Mr. Chair and members, it's not necessarily a definitive answer to why you may not want to expand it, but I'll, I'll just point out that domestic assault by strangulation is a specific crime, and this provision is adding a subdivision to that specific crime. So I think that's why the bill is drafted that way and focused that way. Yeah. You know, as a policy matter, if the committee wanted to expand it, that'd be another thing, but that's the specific now, Mr. Backus, there isn't a separate crime assault by strangulation, is there? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, no, there's not a specific crime other than a domestic assault one. So, so if someone, if it were a non-domestic situation and there were a, a strangulation, that would fall under the general assault statute, is that right? Mr. Chair, members, that's correct. Thank you. Senator Howell. No, oh, I, I, I'm just puzzled why it's a separate deal and we don't pay for all domestic violence uh, investigations, but uh, it seems odd that there's a separate piece there. But Mr. Chair, Senator um, Gustafson. my testifier can has a little bit of clarity on that as well, if, if it's a short answer, if that helps. Ms. Miller. Thank you. 
Yeah, so strangulation and domestic violence is not only far more common, but it is separate. So it's a separate offense than if it were you and I versus me and an intimate partner. It's charged separately. Any further discussion? Senator Seberger. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Pappas already moved the bill. So Mr. Chairman, Senator just Pappas, trying to move things along here. I see that. <laughs> Senator Pappas moves that Senate File 1038 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senator Marty, Catalytic Converters. Senate File 5 before the committee. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Senator committee. Marty. Um, Senate File 5 is to address the problem of catalytic converter thefts. I rarely have had a prop like this, but the um, but Department of Commerce provided this for the hearing today, and um, it didn't come from any of your cars. Um, but, that um, we know of. If, that we know of. <laughs> We'll if, find if, out if after a committee hearing we go back to our cars. Show it around the committee, you can see what they're like. But it's a piece of corroded, dirty, this one's cleaned up a little bit. Um, part of the exhaust system of the car has been a huge problem with thefts. We lost one of our testifiers. We had to um, return to another commitment um, from the Department of Commerce. But uh, they say that we are maybe the third highest state in terms of total catalytic converter thefts. The reason for the theft, this is part of your exhaust system under the car. Um, it has some um, precious metals, palladium, rhodium, and platinum. And um, platinum is worth um, more than gold, and rhodium is worth 10 times as much as that. So rhodium is actually, a year ago, was selling for $26,000 an ounce. So even though there are only trace amounts in these, Cutting this off the bottom of your car and selling it can bring somebody, depending on the type of converter, somewhere between 400 and maybe 1,500 bucks. Um, so they, and they can cut them off. This one was obviously hacksawed off with a sawzall or something can take a um, battery operated sawzall can cut it in less than a minute. And so it's very quick to get them off the car, very easy to do, and they sell them. And it costs the victims a lot of money. I have a constituent or former constituent witness here who would just tell you a very quick typical story about it. But the bill basically what we're trying to do, this is a thing we came up with a couple years ago and I think um, the international auto theft investigators have said there were like six provisions or so you need in order to get a handle on this issue. They say our bill model accomplishes all of them would be a good model for other states. Um, the fundamental thing that we take to do is the trouble is with this, there's no markings on it. Um, you can figure out what kind of cars it fits on and so on, but you don't know which car. The vehicle identification number on every car produced in the world, 16-digit code, is not on these. Uh, it would have been nice if somebody had thought to do that. Um, there have been proposals to have auto dealers and others mark them all that way. We're figuring a smarter way to get them marked is just say, it's illegal to possess a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a car unless it's got the vehicle identification number on it. That's real easy for you to do if you do repair work and need to change the catalytic converter, which almost nobody ever has to do. Muffler shops, even a large muffler shop, I understand, may go through 50 of them a year. I mean, they replace a lot because there's so much business people coming in, they need a new one. But they're not taking them off, and they may have 50 a year if it's a large muffler shop. Auto scrapper gets, every car has at least one, every internal combustion car has at least one, and, but they are taking, they're stripping cars down for tires and engines and everything else, and they generally have a good inventory system. When something's worth a thousand bucks, you're gonna take care of it and you're gonna track it and everything else. So this bill would simply require, make it a crime to possess one that doesn't have the vehicle identification number on it. So when you take it off the car, even if you, it says you can actually use just a permanent marker, but you have to write the number on it right away. And then you can sell it, but you could only sell it under this legislation, not to somebody who contacts you from Craigslist or anything like that, not to a on the street 
buyer who will meet you in a parking lot to buy them. You can only sell them to a registered scrap metal dealer. Um, would require a paper trail to go through it. It's, there are a number of provisions. I can go into more details in the bill if you want, but briefly um, have a couple of amendments I'd like to have considered. Uh, these are not, quote, author's amendments. This is not the first committee. One of them I offered yesterday, but postponed to today so people could take a better look at it. The other one was based on suggestions Senate Council said to make it fit into our law better, but we're not trying to increase the penalties. What we're basically saying is since 99% of the things that are being sold one-on-one -on -one are stolen, and that's uh, just a guess, but I bet it's pretty accurate, and that is to say that um, you would have a penalty equivalent to the theft statutes. We're trying to track them. We figure if they're worth between, say, 400 and 12, 1,500 bucks, we picked it arbitrarily, said 500 bucks is what they'd be equivalent worth for theft. Again, if you get, lose it from your car, it could cost you 3,000 bucks. But, um, but we picked it at 500, which means one would be a misdemeanor, two would be gross, three would be felony, et cetera, enhancing the penalties because we're both trying to get after the, the people who are stealing and make it a crime to do it right away, to have it. Um, and number two, to um, get the bigger operations that are marketing, dealing with thousands and thousands of these. And with that, Mr. Chair, you can either deal with the amendments or I have two witnesses. Um, I can call them. They'll be brief. Why don't we have your witnesses first and then we'll do the amendments. We have, um, we have um, from the Corcoran Police, um, Matt Gottschalk, and we have um, George Bentley, who's a, a typical victim, and there, we think there could be as many as 100,000 a year in Minnesota. Go ahead, Mr. Bentley. Mr. Bentley, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state Mr. your Chairman, name. Mr. Chairman, committee, Proceed. I think my story is probably fairly standard to this kind of crime. Can you please um, state your name for the record and then George go George Bentley. Thank you. Uh, my wife was at work one day at the Health Partners offices on, uh, in Maplewood on White Bear Avenue. She had driven the car that day. Um, due to inclement weather, she usually rode her bike there when she could. When she came out of work that day, the car was very loud. She called me in somewhat of a you know, worried frame of mind, said, is it okay to drive it home? She was pretty well aware of what had happened. Um, I said, yeah, I think that'll work. Just stay off the highway, take it slow. Um, to cut to the chase of the story, though, the ultimate economic impact on this was, uh, it began with a $1,000 deductible on our insurance policy, and then um, it moved on to approximately $350 to put a catalytic converter shield on the Prius. This was a Toyota Prius, and I you know, read quite a bit that it's one of Thieves' favorite cars to hit because Toyota puts very high quality converters on their cars with lots of, lots of the catalytic metals. And uh, then we shelled out about another $500 to have a uh, exhaust system guard placed on our other vehicle. So that is uh, pretty typical, I think. Um, obviously, if somebody doesn't have sufficient insurance or is, you know, foregone to have uh, um, comprehensive on their car insurance policy, it's going to have it a lot harder. And Mr. Chair, just Thank you, Mr. Bentley. common Senator nature Marty. of this, I've heard from at least three people, not constituents, but who have said that their condo or apartment building with a locked garage underneath it was broken into one that told me last week, they said they had two converters stolen mm -hmm. and the cameras in the garage showed the car was only in there for three minutes. They got two converters off of cars in that three minute period of time. And I have um, Chief Gottschalk from Corcoran. Chief Gottschalk, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to testify here today. Um, Chair and members, my name is Matt Gottschalk. I'm the Director of Public Safety in Corcoran and currently the Vice President for the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the association, representing more than 300 police chiefs across the state and over 150 command staff. Um, as you know, there's continued to be a massive increase in catalytic converter thefts over the past years in our communities. Uh, these thefts have huge impacts on our communities across the state, not just the um, financial impacts, but also people's ability to get to work and um, their, their uh, overall transportation. So 
There's been some progress in some pilot programs in the past, but Senate File 5 finally takes the appropriate steps to establish a criminal penalty for unauthorized possession or purchase of catalytic converters. Uh, as an association, we believe this bill will help curb these thefts and will appropriately hold the individuals and groups accountable that are committing the crimes. We'd also like to thank Senator Marty for bringing up this important That's bill, and we proudly support Senate File 5. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Shall I call you Chief or Director? What's uh, either one. All right, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Senator Marty, is that uh, the extent of your testifiers? Yes, I do have. Um, right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Essenson wanted to speak from Scrap Metal Industry, which approached me this week, and we've agreed we're going to sit down with them and talk with them about concerns. I want to say that the County Attorneys Association has endorsed the bill, Minnesota Insurance Federation, both of them had testimony yesterday in another committee, uh, but Mr. Essenson's here as well, briefly. Mr. Estenson, go ahead, please. State your name. Mr. Chair, uh, members, Jeremy Estenson, uh, Taft Advisors, working on behalf of the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries. Um, uh, other members uh, in other committees have heard my comments, so I'm going to keep them very brief. Uh, Senator Marty has uh, wonderfully agreed to meet with us um, for a couple of reasons. One, the commodities marketplace in which recycling takes place is complicated, and there's some things in the bill that we need to work on. Uh, two, we see the criminals occasionally uh, and have ideas about who they are and what they're doing. We think we can bring some information to the table, and Mr. Chair, uh, members, we also understand that in industry there are bad actors, and we want to do our part to clean up our side of the street. Um, however, there uh, the vast majority of catalytic converters stolen in Minnesota don't end up in Minnesota. And um, so, to be perfectly honest, we have a business interest because those catalytic converters, were they to uh, extend through the end of their useful life, would end up in one of our yards, and we'd like to recycle them. So, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll uh, conclude my comments, but we're very grateful to <coughs> Senator Marty and uh, uh, his uh, uh, willingness to work with us. Thank you. And I'm just going to note, Mr. Essenson, this bill has been around for a couple of years, and uh, we're in the committee hearing now, and I'm being told that you're going to continue to work with the author on some stuff that might fall within our jurisdiction, because most of the bill does, um, after it supposedly, leave, supposedly leaves here. I'm a little bit concerned about that. I don't know why this is coming to light today while we're in committee. I mean, I know the bill's moved a little quickly this year, but it's been around for a long time. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. If, if that's directed to me uh, and members, um, Senator Marty was gracious enough to take a meeting with us uh, the other day where we were able to start airing some of our concerns. Um, and to your point, I, um, it really has been a time crunch. Uh, I'll, I'll own that responsibility. Um, and. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know, I would defer to Senator Marty as to whether or not there would need to be some sort of procedural thing that would take place. Mm, Senator Mr. Marty. Mr. Chair, I think most of the things should be, I mean, I think the bill should work where we want to make sure that it's not onerous or anything to anybody involved and we'll work that, I, I, we won't hear the bill, I told him we won't hear the bill in finance for a couple of weeks, so there, if there are any difficulties, we could do it either there or if there are things related to your committee, we could bring it back here. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Loomer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at least for the record, the Judiciary Committee in the Senate has not given this bill a hearing for at least the last four years. So this might be the very first time this committee has had a hearing, and that's what maybe trigger uh, the testimony and uh, a fuller uh, discussion about it and how it affects uh, commerce in the state of Minnesota. So, with Senator Marty's representation that um, if there are any substantive changes proposed that would be within the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction, uh, we can talk about bringing it back to Judiciary to review those. Um, I think we can proceed today, but if they're out, if they're, this bill was in commerce yesterday, so it's kind of a joint jurisdiction <coughs> over almost the entire bill. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Commerce Committee deal with their own jurisdiction issues, but as far as we're concerned, um, I think we might need to see it again if there are changes that are made, and I'm, I'm happy doing that um, if we need to. I just want to make sure that, you know, finance isn't doing judiciary work, just like we don't do any more than just our judiciary work on finance bills. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and 
you know, I, I see uh, the chief is still back there. I, I'd kind of like to ask him a question is, it seems like you can go online and, and see names of these, some of these folks that are, that are interested in buying these. Uh, but my question to the chief would be, what resources do we need to give you to be able to actually prosecute some of these folks that are doing it? What, what resources do we, do, does the state or do the, do, do the jurisdictions need to give you in order to actually put these guys back behind bars? Chief Godshaw. Thank you. Um, the biggest tool really, and I think that this, that's what this helps accomplish, is getting that penalty for unauthorized possession and purchase. So getting those, you know, there's, there's pilot programs in place now that help us identify them, track them, but I think the structure provided by this bill actually gives us a lot of the um, authority to take action when we find that, and especially when we find the repeat offenders with multiple catalytic converters, some people in, in possession of dozens of them. And Mr. Chair? Senator Howe. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Marty. If you Mr. Want. Chair, Senator Howe, the other thing, the, the difficulty is we've heard from police departments all over the state that they will see a car and there are five or ten of these things sawed off. I mean, if, if you're working on your car, you're not just hacksawing them off. You're taking them off cleanly so you can put on a new one. Um, but they're finding ten of them in the car, maybe a sawzall in the back seat and everything else, but they have no probable cause because where do they come from? <coughs> oh, my brother has a muffler shop and gave them to me or whatever, and they have no probable cause to stop them, and they let them go. And I've heard that from Maplewood. I've heard that from several other departments. And so what we need to have, it's a crime to possess these things if, if they're, I, I'd make the case 99 plus percent of the ones they stop are stolen. And let's just say how we do it. So that's what we're trying to do is set up a framework by which it's a crime simply to possess one of these things that's not marked properly. And the way to do it simply is say, look, if you've got one and you can't show it's whatever, we make a simple law. You don't have to do lots of burdensome stuff. Just have to write the VIN number on it and so, it, so we can track it down. Because law enforcement can immediately run a VIN number. And if it came from a car registered in your name, we, they call you up and did you give this guy your catalytic converter? No, they stole it. Well, they got the for theft. If they don't have a number on or put a false number on, then they got you for violating the law. And the penalties are the same <coughs> as theft. And I think our theft penalties work pretty good for that. We just have to have it fall under that category. All right, we have an A-10 amendment um, that is in members' packets. Um, Senator Marty, maybe I'll ask Senator back or Mr. Backus to go ahead and just Sure, go ahead. Explain the amendment briefly, Thank please. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, members, on, on page one, the A-10 deletes section six and then essentially reinserts it. The changes from lines 1.3 to 1.19 are essentially technical. These felonies, these penalties are already in the bill, but they're slightly reworded. Uh, the substantive thing being done here is on lines 1.20 to 1.24. This provides that essentially catalytic converters possessed, purchased, or acquired within a six-month period may be aggregated and then charged accordingly. And if two or more offenses are committed by the same person in two or more counties, the person may be prosecuted in any one county for all of the offenses. This language is basically taken straight from the theft crime. Uh, on page two... Um, section 10 is somewhat of a conforming change. Uh, basically, a, Section 11, uh, the bill currently provides that a, uh, upon conviction for one of these new crimes in the bill, a, the actual catalytic converter involved would be considered contraband property and will be summarily forfeited. Uh, what Section 11 does is it provides, though, it... Uh, so if we didn't say anything else, the law enforcement agency would have to either destroy that catalytic converter or use it for law enforcement purposes, which presumably they wouldn't do. So this provides that they would have to, they would have to sell it to a scrap metal dealer, and then they would have to make reasonable efforts to determine whether the person from whom it was stolen can be identified. If so, they would forward the proceeds to that person. If unable to do this, they would, they would be able to keep 70% of the proceeds and forward the remaining 30% to the prosecutorial office that prosecuted the case. And then assuming the catalytic converter is not properly marked as required in the bill, the agency would essentially mark it in a permanent matter as being contraband, uh, recovered contraband. So that, that, would, that would allow basically, and then 
Section 10 amends the bill to basically say a person who possesses a catalytic converter marked that way is not committing a crime. Any questions or discussion relating to the A-10 amendment? Not seeing any. Uh, Senator Seberger moves adoption of the A-10 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. We also have in front of us the A-11 amendment, members. It's in your packet. And Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll explain Senator this one Marty. very briefly. I introduced this one yesterday, and then um, yeah, we're making sure everybody can have a look at it, um, held it back for today, and we'd like to have it offered here. But this is simply taking a fact. We had a law passed in about 2013 or so. It was trying to get after some of the rogue towing companies where they'll just pick a car off the street, say it was abandoned, bring it to a scrapyard, and scrap it. And, <coughs> and it, one part of that was repealed, and that was part to have it entered into an electronic database because it wasn't finished at the time. Um, the database that we're using in the rest of this bill is one the Department of Public Safety would approve. They could do their own, but I think they're likely to contract for one. But that one is one that I think pawn shops and law enforcement is already very familiar with and uses regularly. This would say that if a scrap dealer gets one of these scrap automobiles, they have to record the VIN number and send that in in the database so people can know right away. They already have to enter it in some national database that doesn't show up for a month, but by then the car is gone. And we had a news story a month ago or so talked about it. Some woman's car was stolen at a gas station, presumably just a joyrider who jumped, left it on the side of the road. Some guy took it in. She gets, first she hears is a notice from the Department of Public Safety that her vehicle was scrapped um, six months later. And nobody authorized it. Nobody checked to see if it was stolen, anything else. So this is a simple one that would reinstate that, and it's, it shouldn't be burdensome because they're already entering this data in a thing that doesn't report for a month, and it's the same okay. database that would be used in here. So I'd Thank love you. to have this added to the bill. It's separate from catalytic converters, but it's the same type of auto theft thing, making sure you can track it and making sure they can have a chance to crack down on the bad actors. Yeah. Senator Marty, this uh, came up in Commerce yesterday, and uh, it, the bill was passed out of commerce over to us with the understanding that this amendment was going to be worked on and would follow the bill. So I'm taking that as authorization from Chair Klein uh, that he, he was passing jurisdiction over to us to consider this amendment and treat it that way. Um, so not looking around at our members, I don't see any discussion. Uh, Senator Seberger moves adoption of the A11 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? Motion prevails, the amendment's adopted. All right, to Senate File 5, as amended, are there any, is there any further discussion uh, or questions from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to do a, do a quick shout out to the Chief Gottschalk, who came from my district in Corcoran, Minnesota. And thank you for coming down, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, but Senator uh, Marty, uh, as I'm looking at page 5 of the bill, um, where it states on line 14, it starts prohibiting possessing a catalytic converter. Uh, I'm one of those guys that drive my cars right into the ground. I squeeze every dollar out of them I can. And then I usually, they're so worn out and beaten up and not working, I bring them right to a scrapyard. Uh, now that I, if I'm under the impression that the catalytic converter under that car is worth something more, um, if I cut it off and leave it in my garage, am I violating the law? Mr. Senator Ch Marty. Mr. Chair, Senator Loomer, not if you mark the VIN number on it and the date you took it off the car. Um, frankly, when you're negotiating with a scrapyard on it, um, scrap cars have gone up in value by five, six, seven hundred bucks, depending on the converters, because uh, most cars have more than one converter on them. And they can... Um, so it should add to the value, the scrap value of the car. They have costs for getting rid of everything. But again, the tires, if they're any good, they take anything off that's any value. Probably the most valuable thing in a lot of scrap cars is this. Senator well, Lummer, follow-up question? I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, the good old guy who uh, works on his cars all the time, and he doesn't read this bill. Uh, is he inadvertently going to be breaking the law by not 
uh, taking a Sharpie sure. out and writing a VIN number on it. Sure. Senator Mr. Marty. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, about two years ago when we earlier had this bill, some guy from northern Minnesota said, I got two catalytic converters. I took them off my cars when I was working on them. What can I do? I need to be able to sell them. We said, just mark the stuff on it, and you can take them in. This guy somewhere in northern Minnesota heard about the bill, was taking a look at it, and said how, and perfect. All they have to do is that, and frankly, very few people are taking off. I don't, if you know a lot of people who do a lot of auto repair work on their own cars, never heard of anybody, oh, I need to replace the catalytic converter. Um, but it does happen. This does allow them a way to do that. And um, hey, I'd like this bill to be effective immediately, but um, that's the reason we have an August 1st thing, so that there is some public notice that there are law changes so people can be aware of new crimes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Limmer. What's to stop a criminal from just writing down any old VIN number? Is sure. the scrap dealer going to check every single catalytic converter um, and, and then try and find the vehicle that it matches in some computer? Mr. Chair, um, um, the scrap Martin. dealer, first of all, cannot buy one without that marked on it. Um, and again, it's easy for the muffler shop or the scrapper or you taking off your car to mark it on. So yeah. The thief can just look in the windshield, get the VIN number and copy it on there. If they do that, then law enforcement or whoever gets it, whenever it's sold or whatever you type in the VIN number, oh, it belongs to Senator Limmer. They call you up and, did you give this to the guy? No, you didn't give it to the guy, so they know it's stolen. If he put on a false one, which would be a likely scenario, that's what the first thing they likely try is a false one. But um, in terms of, you know, law enforcement can see that too. If it's a car that's not from Minnesota, wrong kind of converter and so on, they can quickly track that down. And if you put the false number on, you didn't comply with the law, so you still got the same felony penalty. So, Mr. Chair, we're trying to do it in a logical way and the person, the only person who has trouble doing it is the thief, because they could write the right one on or they could write the wrong one on, and frankly, they write no one on it in any way they're going to be caught. If, if you get somewhere along the process, you can stop it. Any further discussion on Senate File 5 as amended? All right, Senator Seberger. Mr. Chair, I move Senate File 5, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Finance Committee. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. All right, uh, members, uh, I've just been informed that we have some, uh, that there is not another committee coming in after us, so we are able to finish the next two items on our agenda. Uh, Senate File 426, Senator Umu Verbatim. Senator Umu Verbaten, uh, we have an amendment, an A1 amendment in the packet. This is your bill's first stop. So Senator Umu Verbaten moves her author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. To your bill, Senator. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today I'm presenting Senate File 426 by request of the Peace Officer Standards and Training, or POST Board. This bill represents a change uh, to our statutes to allow law enforcement agencies to share criminal uh, history background check data with the POST Board. This is for the purpose of determining an applicant's eligibility for licensing. Under current statute, local, uh, local agencies are prohibited from sharing criminal history data with the post board because it is not considered a criminal justice or law enforcement agency. Currently, law enforcement agencies are permitted to access this information for very specific reasons, such as employment and criminal investigation. However, there are strict uh, conditions regarding who the data may be shared with and under what conditions. 
in order to protect the integrity of our peace officer licensing process, the board is expected to ensure that individuals who have engaged in disqualifying conduct are not issued peace officer licenses. However, without this data sharing authority, there is the possibility that an unqualified candidate will be able to simply apply to another agency upon rejection from the first because that data was not shared with the post board. So this bill addresses that issue and ensures the integrity of our peace officer licensing system and ultimately it protects the public. And I do have, um, how do I say your last name? Missolt. I have Mr. Missolt um, here with us from the post board to testify. Mr. Missolt, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Go ahead. Thank you, nice to be here in person. It's been a while. Um, my name is Eric Misselt. I'm the Executive Director with the Minnesota Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. Um, I really can't add a whole lot to uh, Senate File 46 in terms of the um, uh, comments by uh, Senator Verbaten. So uh, other than to say that if, if one of the questions that came up on the House side was, uh, aren't you in fact, haven't you in fact been getting this information already um, in the past? And the answer to that is yes, um, but we shouldn't have been as we find out. So uh, this language um, rectifies that. We worked with the BCA, got very specific language. It came from the FBI uh, that uh, basically becomes an enabling statute to allow us to um, properly uh, receive this information when uh, disqualifying events are found during a background check. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Missell. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce the A-1 amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Limmer, we've already adopted the A-1 amendment as an author's amendment. All right. Making my job really easy, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> That's our goal here, Senator Limmer. <laughs> I'll quote you sometime in the future. <laughs> All right. You just go along, you'll get, your job will be very easy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other, Senator Pappas? Mr. Chairman, I would move that Senate Bill 426 as amended be recommended to pass. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Pappas moves that Senate Bill 426 as amended be recommended to pass and go to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senate Bill 427, Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm also presenting uh, Senate File 427 by request of the Post Board. This bill would allow county and local authorities to share data with the Post Board when the Board uh, has ordered an investigation into peace officer misconduct. The Post Board does not conduct its own investigations into complaints of officer misconduct, but uh, it does designate law enforcement agencies to conduct investigations on the board's behalf. And in most cases, the agency employing the officer has already completed an internal investigation. They collect much of the same data that the post board uh, needs to determine if there's a violation and if licensing sanctions are in order. Uh, however, information from those investigations are often not passed to the post board. Local government entities and agencies will refuse to provide this information at the advice of their counsel, um, often citing data practices restrictions. This has happened even in cases where the chief law enforcement officer has reported the licensee misconduct and asked for the post board action, and they wanted to cooperate with the investigation. Um, other state licensing boards have statutes and rules that allow them to share this data while the post board does not. There's a great example with the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, or PELSB, which requires local boards, directors, and superintendents to provide files from their investigations. Um, so without this access, the post board really has two options. They can either issue subpoenas and ask for the co uh, the court order, or they can order a full new investigation. So in either case, it just delays the process, and it's really not beneficial to someone who's awaiting the fate of their license or those who are filing the complaint. And this bill addresses these issues, it promotes more efficiency, and it really just adopts the best practices of other boards. And then I will pass to Mr. Mislet to offer more testimony again. Mr. Mislet. Okay, uh, 
Thank you, Chair Lumer. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Chair Letts. Whoa. <laughs> Oh boy, dead in the water. Sounds um, like you need that vacation. I do, I do. <laughs> bad habits um, are hard to stop. Uh, <laughs> I agree, Senator Limmer, bad habits. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Latz and members of the committee. Um, the only thing I will, I will add a couple of uh, main points uh, that were also discussed during the uh, House hearing on this. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, this is only when there's an official investigation that we have determined is within our jurisdiction. So one of the current concerns when I uh, first floated this with law enforcement um, uh, entities, organizations out there, the associations, was that um, this potentially would be fishing, uh, the ability uh, for posts to go on fishing expeditions. Not the case at all. This is only going to be where the local official, county, city, whatever, is notified that we are doing an investigation and it is, in with our, as it is within our jurisdiction. And as under rule, I have, uh, as the executive director on behalf of the board, ordered an investigation. Um, second, uh, the data classifications here, uh, whether it's private or uh, confidential data, uh, that comes to us, um, the s classification of that data does not change just by virtue of it coming to the post board. Uh, we handle, we currently handle uh, private data on a regular basis in investigations, um, uh, complaints of officer misconduct, et cetera, and we are subject to uh, the restrictions under ch uh, Chapter 13. Um, board members are bound by that as well. So. Um, just because the data comes to us, it does not change classification. Um, it also does not change number, uh, third thing I want to mention is that this does not change the due process that officers uh, or licensees are <coughs> accorded under, um, under statute and rule. Uh, this does not change the process in terms of going through the complaint investigation committee, uh, having the opportunity to um, have the case heard at an administrative law, in front of an administrative law judge, and so on. Um, and uh, finally, uh, in terms of classification of the data, um, confidential data in particular, as, as you all know, is data that is, um, uh, cannot be shared, with, is not public data, and also cannot be shared with the individual. I want to emphasize that while that is included in here, um, it is only for those rare cases where we may need to get confidential data, and there may be a good reason not to share that with the subject. Um, in most cases, we are dealing with private data, um, as comes out from internal affairs investigations or internal files um, to the agency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Misselt. Uh, Rich Neumeister has also signed up to testify. Mr. Neumeister. Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Rich Neumeister. Usually, confidential data in a law enforcement setting is an active criminal investigation, an undercover person's name, or generally reporter of child abuse, you know, who reports child abuse, sexual assault. Mr. Chairman, the bill uh, with this language on 118 after files, period, is one that would allow a professional licensing board to ask for active criminal investigation, which I have never seen in any other professional licensing board, whether it be doctors, lawyers, social workers. This is a little thing, and it might be, but Officer Neumeister, if I was much younger, and I did something bad, like sexual, alleged sexual assault, or domestic, or whatever it might be, which may pique the interest of a professional licensing board, able to get active <coughs> criminal investigative data because they may be investigating an officer for violation, which that investigation is going on, just boggles my mind in terms of overall policy here in the state of Minnesota when there is no other access for a professional licensing board. So Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, in that point, I would move, if you so desire, so I'm sorry, but you know, I would suggest to move. See, as you know, sometimes I get called Senator, I mean, you do so many of these things. But to suggest that after line on 118, after the period, confidential data through 120 be deleted. 
or some variation of modification of the word confidential. So, Mr. Chairman, that's my main point, and that's why I waited all the time to make those comments important. Thank you, Mr. Neumeister. <coughs> Mr. Missell, could you respond as to what value, if any, it is in getting confidential data as, as a part of your investigation? Certainly. Um, I don't think confidential data, first off, and I'm not an attorney, but um, or I've been mistaken for one, um, uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, active criminal investigation. It may be, but there is other uh, confidential data that may be out there. Um, specifically, I guess I would say that in, in a case where you have a criminal, ongoing criminal investigation, while I cannot obviously promise future what a future board or, or executive director might do. Um, that is not likely going to be the kind of data that we're going to get in the middle of or jeopardize a criminal, a potential criminal case. The standard for the post board for many, many years, um, for well prior to this, was to wait for a criminal investigation to conclude, um, primarily because our rules require a, a conviction under, um, under our standards of conduct. Um, that said, and again, I think it's extremely rare, but there could be a situation where some confidential data is necessary as part of the investigation. And, um, and this was when we worked on this with the Attorney General's office, they felt it was important to include that as a potential eventuality, uh, understanding it may be rare. And again, I would emphasize that um, I'm not sure what the concerns would be of the uh, regulatory board that has to oversee licensing and make sure that officers that are not qualified do not uh, get the badge or and or continue to serve in that capacity. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the um, belief is that we would do with that data, especially since it is confined to an uh, official investigation. So, Mr. Missell, if um, if there's an ongoing active criminal investigation at the local level, um, are you saying you would not be requesting confidential data at that point? You'd be waiting until after that investigation is concluded anyway? If it would, if it's data that is, I'm, is it data, it is data that is specifically involved with a criminal investigation. Um, I can't. I can't assure you that that would not happen, and that the statute wouldn't. Uh, the board. The board would come. Could come to me and say, or the executive director at the time, and say, "We want you to open a licensing investigation." I'm saying it is unlikely, nor uh, has not been their practice um, that we would not do that. Uh, so, I mean, we could contemplate language that would carve out active investigative data from the provision for disclosure. Um, and so that might be one option, although I do have a little bit of a concern that sometimes local police departments leave investigations technically open or active for quite an extended period of time. Um, perhaps, I don't, I don't know if it necessarily closes after a conviction or if it gets left open, but it might interfere if, if there's something they're not sure that they can prove to the point of conviction, So they, but they leave it open and then you wouldn't be able to conduct any kind of a licensing investigation. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a valid concern. Uh, that's one. <clears throat> um, and that's why the, it would be important to have this language, if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, and uh, there are there are potential. There's also the potential, and that's why I say it's not necessarily criminal investigative data, where uh, an agency may be conducting an internal investigation unknown to the officer, uh, for good reason, um, because of what they're doing, um, and a request our assistance. This again would allow us to get that information, despite the subject not of the investigation not being able to have that data, and it may have nothing to do with a criminal charge. It may be still um, an internal matter. Uh, within the agency. And you would still be subject to the That's correct. Uh, chapter 13 restrictions on the That's use correct. of the data. All right. Mr. Neumeister, you want to follow up with my questions? Mr. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, in regards to um, if it's just an internal investigation that he doesn't want the person to know about, it would be considered private. There is no, in any part of law, where a confidential investigation on an employee can happen. It's 
it's basically employees do know. Um, that's a whole different thing when you're saying that investigation of an employee is confidential. It's usually private, and then what happens in those situations, if a person finds out and wants to ask about it, they can do, they can do so. And then and they get it under the term of the classification of private. I hope that clarifies, at least to the point to where I'm raising earlier. Thank you. And Council, take a look at, at uh, those provisions and we'll give us some guidance as well. Uh, while she's doing that, anyone else have any questions or comment on the bill before us? Chairman? Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect to Mr. Neumeister, I'm just thinking about um, kind of higher standards here. We, I mean, we really do hold law enforcement officers, and we should, to a higher standard. And that might be why there would be a difference here in terms of investigation into their, you know, alleged misconduct. Mr. Missalt, did you want to respond? Uh, so to that end, um, I guess I would offer that as in the case of the um, which we are all painfully aware of uh, the Chauvin uh, case a couple years back. Um, certainly that went to criminal uh, investigation and so on um, and went through a long process. That would have been a case where, uh, well, at the time, because of the way things stood, our hands were tied um, on being able to uh, go further into that and to get data. Uh, that would be a case where there may be strong public interest in, may, in taking swift action on part of the board that was basically roadblocked by not having this ability. I offered that as an example, to your point. And any, any thoughts, Mr. Ms. Sultan, whether that would be considered private data or confidential data? I'll leave that up to council. I'll, uh, I'll stay in my lane and leave that up to council. <laughs> Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a good discussion to have. Um, uh, if there's a pending criminal investigation, uh, oftentimes there might be evidence or uh, witness statements taken. Um, does the board collect uh, evidence <coughs> or or witness statements to the same quality that a court would require? And if they made a decision prematurely uh, based on limited knowledge other than accusation, uh, I would tend to think that it might prejudice a case that would be awaiting trial. And I don't know if you really want to go down that path uh, and I can understand why the board would be cautious in making a conclusion without a criminal uh, uh, find of guilt in that. I'm just thinking out loud, but I, I wouldn't want to interrupt that. And then if there truly <coughs> really was a, um, a bad player to have his case thrown out if it prejudiced the court. So I can understand why you might want to be cautious in trying to figure out what steps you would take in, this, in the event that this was passed. I'm all for holding police and law enforcement accountable to the rule of law, but we also have to pay attention to the civil rights of the defendant as well. Ms. Primo, do you have an update for us on the Chapter 13 question? Mr. Chair and members, yes. So under the personnel data statute, that is generally private data. However, if we look at 13.39, which covers civil investigations, so these are civil investigations that are taken by a government entity. And that data, while that investigation is active, is confidential or protected non-public. And um, this is somewhat of a guess, but I, I think the data that the board may be interested in that's confidential is related to that and not necessarily related to the active criminal investigation under 13.82. Uh, 
So they have the same classification, though. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Missile. Um, again, why it's a good idea for me to stay in my lane? What you just articulated is exactly um, the direction um, to to. Senator Limmer's point, and as I mentioned earlier, um, best practice is not for us as an administrative agency, a licensing agency, to go anywhere near a criminal investigation if we can at all possibly help it or to jeopardize that potential investigation. But it is, in fact, more directed toward, um, and I thank you uh, for articulating it that way, the personnel data that can be um, actionable on our part. To her point. So the personnel data is, then is considered to be confidential data or private data? Mr. Chair and members, personal data generally is private data. However, if there's an active, if there's some sort of civil investigation going on within the government entity, um, setting aside personnel data. The data that is part of that investigation that I think the board might be interested in is what's classified as confidential. So um, they're, they're sort of two separate dual track lanes that perhaps the board is trying to get at, um, both in the personnel data side as well as potential civil investigations by the law enforcement agency. So I think the ultimate question then, if I'm understanding this, is... Uh, is whether or not we're comfortable allowing any of this data, carrying with it whatever protection it has to go to the post board so the post board can do whatever investigation they feel they need to do, and whether we trust the post board then to, in their discretion, to decide when to ask for it so they don't interfere with an active investigation of one sort or another. It seems to me that's, that's the way I'm looking at it anyway. Mr. Massell? Yes, um, I, I think that is uh, definitely the case. And um, I guess the example building off of that where this could, be re uh, could very well be relevant, and this is something that has happened in my tenure here where um, there's an uh, allegation or accusation that perhaps an agency uh, did not adequately in investigate, so you have a uh, internal investigation that's ongoing under conduct that may fall under our jurisdiction. It ends with either a unfound, uh, not an unfounded, but a not sustained, uh, and so that ends it at the agency level. Now, um, arguably, that would no longer be active data once that final disposition is issued, but I don't think it's unheard of for um, and I, I believe it may have been, um, uh, and I apologize if it's not attributable to you, Senator Limmer, about um, keeping things open uh, and agencies keeping things open for an extended period of time. Um, that may be data that we want to get at. The agency's concluded their work, but in fact hasn't come to a conclusion, uh, which may be fine within their particular purview, but under our um, standards of conduct, and uh, the standard that we have to meet in proving a violation of a standard of conduct, which is lesser, um, we, we would want to be able to get at that data. And if that's classified as ongoing investigated, investigative data or open investigation data, that would um, not be available if we didn't have this. All right, is there any further discussion relating to the bill in its current form. Senate file 427. Not seeing it. Senator Seaberger. Mr. Chair, I move that Senate file 427 uh, be recommended to pass and referred to, where's it going? To the floor. <laughs> Senator Seaberger moves that Senate file 427 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, members, uh, for your hard work today. Um, we are going to be meeting on Friday. Um, it is going to be a hybrid meeting available to the members. So I understand Sen hybrid. So I understand Senator Eichhorn might be joining us uh, remotely. Senator Westland has some other appointments. May or may not be able to join us remotely. 
Um, so uh, we will do the best that we can. We're going to meet at 10. We will recess from 1130 to 1230 and then resume until we're done with the agenda. Um, and uh, so with that, we are adjourned.